Hello and welcome to the Weekly Defence Podcast, the show about defence procurement and military technology. This week we are brought to you in partnership with our sponsor, NAMO. I'm your host, Richard Thomas, and on the show this week, we speak to New York-based defence journalist Jason Sherman about what impact the coronavirus pandemic has had on the US defence industry. And Tim Martin talks to BAE Systems about how machine learning can help the military. But first, let's take a look at some of this week's news. The Taiwanese Air Force will order four US-made MQ-9 Reapers in 2021 in a $166 million deal. This is part of wider Air Force plans to set up a reconnaissance squadron equipped with 12 UAVs to increase the frequency of sorties and reduce risks when conducting surveillance missions across the Taiwan Strait. The procurement comes as Taiwan experiences problems in developing its indigenous Teng Yun UAV. The Extender Mark II version of the Expeditionary High Mobility Transporter has been demonstrated as a possible solution for the Canadian Special Forces. Canada's Next Generation Fighting Vehicle Program will acquire a maximum of 75 vehicles and cost up to 250 million Canadian dollars after a previous attempt to replace Special Forces Humvees was abandoned in 2010. In Europe, the Organisation for Joint Armament Cooperation is evaluating a proposal from MBDA which could see a contract by the end of the year for the company to develop a new air-to-surface weapon for the Tiger Mark III attack helicopter. Airbus and MBDA have already undertaken a weapons integration study. And this week, steel was cut for the first of four new BRF replenishment ships for the French Navy in a ceremony at the Chantier de Atlantique shipyard. The first will be delivered in 2022, the second by 2025, and the remaining two by the beginning of 2029 to replace ageing Durant-class supply vessels. The French Navy will deploy the BRF ships to support the battle group based around its Charles de Gaulle aircraft carrier. And the International Maritime Security Construct confirmed that it had monitored an incident on the 17th of May that saw two fast boats approach a UK-flagged tanker transiting the internationally recommended transit corridor some 100 miles off the coast of Yemen. The UK Maritime Trade Operations initially reported that a vessel had been attacked, while later unconfirmed reports indicated that that there could have been an exchange of fire between the approaching fast boats and the merchant vessel's armed security team. So to discuss this and more, I'm joined by air editor Tim Martin and land reporter Flavia kamagos Hi both. Hi, Reg. So, Tim, this week a, uh, a report from the Russian news agency TASS disclosed information on a possible first Egyptian uh, Su-35 fighter jet entering production. What's the response from the US government on this? Uh, yes, so uh, it's quite an interesting story insofar as we know that uh, it's been reported as of last year that uh, Egypt and Russia had agreed on 26 of the uh, Su-35 jets that you mentioned. Um, and so this um, diplomat, military diplomat, according to um, TASS, uh, has said that uh, the Gagarian aircraft plant has officially launched uh, the first production aircraft for Egypt. Um, as you kind of alluded to, you know what what really will be the impact from the US, um, given that it's a uh, Egypt are a long-standing uh, middle Middle Eastern ally, and they're clearly not mm. uh, too impressed. Uh, but bottom line, the US State Department spokesperson um, that I was in uh, communications with kind of explained that uh, they wouldn't. Uh, comment on unverified press reports, uh, but if the potential purchase um, is concluded, uh, Egypt would be at risk of uh, sanctions and future acquisitions, uh, to use his words. So so what sort of uh, sanctions or acquisitions could be potentially imposed? Yeah, I think first, uh, the first one that's p- probably worth mentioning is that uh, Egypt receives foreign military funding, or sorry, financing funding, uh, which is up to 1.3 billion annually uh, from the US. So that could be potentially uh, reconsidered. Um, and then, of course, the US under the countering uh, America's adversaries through Sanctions Act, um, specifically Section 231, um, mentions uh, that the US. A uh, president is required to impose sanctions on any parties who, to quote the act, knowingly engage in a significant transaction uh, with with Russian defence or intelligence uh, officials. Um, so uh, that would leave you know a number of uh, possible options for for the US um, to to look at. Um, but there's there's no nothing forthcoming uh, just at this stage. So uh, we'll uh, further down the line, perhaps we, we, we might see. Um, you know, a, a full response and perhaps uh, uh, Mike Pompeo, um, the US Secretary of State, um, talking about this uh, in maybe days or, or, or weeks to come because it does seem to be uh, a fairly significant development. I mean, the US doesn't like its its military partners and allies 
purchasing Russian equipment. We can just look at Turkey for that. I mean, do do you do we think that this situation with Egypt could descend into a similar in, in, into a similar rancorous? Uh, situation that the US and Turkey is embroiled in. Yeah, I think there's, I mean, there's potentially, I wouldn't want to overblow it too much, but I genuinely do think that the, you know, there is a, a blueprint that has been set here from um, Turkey being unwinded um, from the, the F-35 program. And, um, you know, there's, there's, there's huge similarities here that if you're going to fly the, the SU-35, particularly NATO and the Allies uh, are going to, to potentially have to cooperate with Egypt. I mean, this would obviously years down the line, but, um, mm. you know, why, why, why exactly would NATO and their allies um, be open to, to flying joint operations with Egypt, flying the, the SU-35, um, when that potentially compromises the, the jets and the, the intelligence from um, ground control stations and, and, and things of that nature. So that, that's probably the, the biggest argument that, um, that the US um, will continue to, to use. Uh, but as to you know, whether we'll see this escalate, I think that the point at which it, it might is uh, when there's a verification of a first delivery made in Egypt, because that's a that's the point at which um, you know there's this is indisputable and and there's evidence that uh, the US can can use and I, I suppose the, the, the political will will so to speak would, would be there then to, to escalate matters. Yep. Um, and there's a, a breaking development in the UK's E7 Wedgetail AEW programme. Uh, what more have you got on that? Yeah, that's a, a curious one because uh, Boeing have come forward and mentioned that they have uh, provided a contract or announced that there's a, a new supplier uh, for the conversion of the aircraft. So that's the 737 Next Generation or um, the commercial airframe is is then converted to the uh, the military standard E7, and which the, is under contract uh, for the UK for the RAF. Um, and it had initially this work uh, had initially been given to um, the engineering firm uh, Marshall Aerospace and Defence. It's headquartered yeah. in, in Cambridge. Um, but as of today, uh, Boeing have said that uh, that work is going to be carried out by STS Aviation. Uh, in in the UK, and um, so I did ask uh, Boeing if um, if they could uh, point to you know what has led to that. Uh, but they they said that uh, Marshall are a, continue to be a valued supplier uh, across uh, programs, um, not just um, but but not any longer uh, on the E seven. And I contacted uh, Marshall also uh, in their head office, and, and they said that there was um, no one on site uh, that could. Uh, that could uh, offer a comment, and they they didn't wish to either confirm or or deny um, the removal of the company from the uh, from the program. Um, but uh, Boeing have just to to, to confirm that. Um, so uh, it's an interesting one, I think, also because um, why the change of heart? Well, you know, both parties not being able to to say exactly why. You know, obviously, it leaves the journalist in the position. Um, not being able to to confirm things, so uh, I don't want to uh, speculate on it. But the the new contractor, what we can say is that STS Aviation were given um, uh, a, a certification um, to which enabled them to overhaul civil and military aircraft in, in April twenty twenty. That certification is um, designated AS nine one one zero zero C. Um, so it was quite important, I think, that the timeline on this. Um, so a month ago, obviously, that you know that came into effect, and, and lo and behold, then the uh, SDS Aviation have, have been given the, the contract for E seven, and, and you know I would imagine also it's quite uh, quite lucrative business too, and um, to go with it. Uh, one other kind of note on this would be that the, the parent company um, is um, SDS uh, Aviation Group. Uh, which is based in uh, Florida. Um, so here you have um, Boeing, the US manufacturer, um, providing work to a U- yes, a UK firm, but uh, owned by a, a US a company. So make of that what you will. I won't. Uh, I won't uh, elaborate on, on uh, anything further, given that uh, there's not been anything forthcoming from the, the companies that I've mentioned. Sure, thanks, Tim. I'll, I'll just add that uh, STS's UK operations are built on the acquisition of Newquay-based Apple Aviation and Monarch Aircraft Engineering Limited's Birmingham site in 2019. So it's a rapid development of a military MRO capability in the UK. Um, 
and it looks like it's well placed to 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 rival Marshall in uh, the work that it's doing. Absolutely. So Flavia, on the land side of things, you wrote a piece uh, on Australia investing in in passive radar technologies. What's the background to that program? Yeah, Richard, Australia is increasing in efforts to provide its armed forces with this type of technology. And the Department of Defense has announced a 1.29 million contract with Celentium Defense. Uh, this Australian company will develop and deliver a prototype of the Maverick M series space passive radar. Uh, it will be a ground based radar and it will provide uh, base situational awareness and will support as well dismounted operations. And um, it will enable soldiers to track and monitor uh, enemy manned and unmanned vehicles and uh, aircraft, and they do they will do this in real time uh, while remaining undetected. Because of this, the M, the the Maverick M series will provide tactical advantages to Australian armed forces, and this radar, including, has a potential for a wide range of both military and civil civilian applications. Uh, the Department of Defense uh, couldn't disclose more details uh, of the performance uh, characteristics of this radar, but they confirmed that the National Armed Forces are likely to receive the system by the end of this year. Okay, Flavia, um, I'll ask a question. might seem a simple question, but then that's, I guess, what I do. Um, what's, what, what's the difference between passive radar and active radar? Including, I think it's a, a relevant question. Uh, traditional active radars, they generate a signature and it sends out blasts of energy and waits for signals to bounce back off uh, objects. Uh, passive radars, they don't require um, a spectrum location to operate and they create no uh, electromagnetic footprint. Uh, it means they don't um, they don't emit a, they don't create uh, a radiational laser, uh, and because of this they are deployable, including in densely populated environments. Mm -hmm. I think it's interesting to highlight the development of passive radars uh, has been conducted by the Australian Defence Innovation Hub. And it focuses on developing new technologies and passive radar systems are considered by, by the Australian Defence Innovation Hub a relevant capability in the future. Including uh, Dermont, another Australian company, also has a, co a contract with the Defence Innovation Hub to develop another type of passive radar. And both Dermont and Celentium Defence prototypes have uh, followed uh, a design brief to be lightweight, to fit inside a soldier pack, and to be de deployed by two people in minutes. And like the Maverick M series passive, passive radar, the um, Dermont system is like to be available by the end of this year. Interesting. Well, any anytime someone ends up talking to me about radar, I end up learning something new. So, Flavia, thanks very much for that. Appreciate it. Coming up next, news editor Ben Vogel is on the line with New York-based defence journalist Jason Sherman to discuss the impact of COVID-19 on the US defence industry and defence spending. Hey, did you know that Shepard Media is fully digital? Yeah, of course. I've already downloaded the app. I love that I can access high-quality stories anywhere, anytime. That's good for when you're deployed, right? I actually like that the stories don't waste my time. It's like the editors know what and when I want to read. And that you don't have to read them. You can watch a video or check out the infographics. Yeah, it's ace. Did you see that piece on Iran? That piece on the Tor M1 air defense system where they outline... Download the free Shepherd News app on the App Store and Google Play, and you can get three months half price on Shepherd Premium News for a limited time. The COVID-19 pandemic is leaving a mark on the global defence industry, and the United States is no exception. 
with me on the line from New York to discuss the steps that the Department of Defense is taking to address the hit from COVID is Jason Sherman. Jason, hello. Good morning, Ben. Hello. Um, first of all, uh, can you uh, tell me how the general situation is in New York? Is it getting slightly easier with the lockdown? Um, it is, Ben. Yeah, the uh, April was a was a was a tough month here, but we all seem to be uh, the, the, there. There are few ambu- fewer ambulances uh, wailing, and everyone seems to be getting uh, used to the social distancing and lots of masks on and. Uh, finding our way toward uh, the new normal. So um, situation much improved, but um, uh, like everywhere else, um, hard to see uh, how things get back to uh, the way they they used to be uh, for a long time. Okay. Um, Speaking of uh, getting back to normal, uh, the uh, U.S. uh, defense industry must be wondering when that uh, is about to happen because uh, it is taking a bit of a hit. Uh, from COVID. Um, As far as you can see, Jason, um, is it too early to assess the the damage or is a pattern beginning to emerge? Well, the Defense Department, like so much uh, of society and the economy, um, uh, has been impacted by COVID, as I'm sure your listeners know. And And the Defense Department uh, has been uh, on, uh, you know, has been very central to the U.S. government's um, response. Pentagon has put North, U.S. Northern Command, based out of Colorado, in charge of coordinating sort of an operational response to uh, to the crisis. Put fifty eight thousand personnel, according to uh, their fact sheets, in in charge of helping uh, coordinate a response. Some very high-profile um, efforts, uh, as I'm sure your viewers are aware, sending these uh, the Navy hospital ships uh, to the east and west coast of the United States in New York and in Los Angeles uh, in in the initial weeks of the pandemic outbreak, and building field hospitals in in big cities, also including here here in New York. So we've got sort of on one hand, so that's one dimension of the the, the U.S. military response. Uh, of course, there was uh, the military itself being affected by uh, by the spread of the virus. Indeed, yeah. We had uh, a couple of Navy ships, including uh, an aircraft carrier. Uh, the Theodore Roosevelt was sidelined by uh, by an outbreak while uh, while transiting in the Pacific, and uh, how that was handled, of course, led led to uh, to the dismissal and the firing of uh, not only the captain of the ship, but uh, the blowback from that ended up being the acting uh, Navy secretary was removed. That's right. It's a subject of a whole other podcast. <laughs> indeed, indeed. So you've you, you've had uh, you've had that. There's been curtailments of major training exercises, including uh, a big a big planned event uh, in Europe. Um, was uh, supposed to have twenty thousand U.S. troops. Uh, so we've seen that's we've right. Seen, we've seen that happen, and then. Uh, there's a you know social distancing uh, mandates have have got so many of us now working from home and the military trying to figure out how to telework and what what does that mean for training and readiness and everyone trying to get their arms around uh, what 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 that means and of course uh, for the part of the Pentagon that thinks about training and equipping and preparing, uh, the, the, the Pentagon is beginning to get its arms around uh, the spread of the virus means uh, for its uh, acquisition uh, system. So uh, the Pentagon's acquisition executive, Ellen Lord, uh, as, as uh, for a short story that I wrote uh, for you guys, um, uh, for Shepard notes that there, the, the Defense Department is expecting a, uh, a sort of a blanket uh, three-month delay to um, at the very least, for all of their major acquisition systems. And schedule delays mean inefficiencies, and, um, and, and that will likely cost uh, on the order of billions and billions of dollars, uh, she said. So we don't know what, what those are exactly, uh, what, what the total amount is exactly, but we're beginning to see some examples of, of what that is. For instance, the Army has, uh, as one example of a, of a program that is um, figuring its way forward, 
Uh, the, the Army has a $7.7 billion program called the Army Integrated Air and Missile Defense Program. Uh, in 2016, this project, uh, so th this is a, uh, a very complex uh, program that aims to stitch together uh, command and control systems and sensors and shooters, notably the Sentinel radar, the Patriot radar, along with uh, Patriot missiles, in order to expand the, uh, the, the Army's ability to see what sort of threats are coming at their forces and assign uh, have any sensor assign the best missile to go shoot down that target. And they had a high stakes uh, test planned this spring uh, as a do over for a failed assessment in 2016 uh, out at White Sands Missile Range. And that is going to be delayed. And the uh, planned production review to transition from development into production um, is now going to be in November as opposed to September. So <clears throat> this is one of, the, one of the Army's big ticket programs, an example of how uh, COVID is, um, is uh, delaying uh, these big projects that DOD is working on. I see. So uh, it's a significant impact across the board, as you say, kind of an a average of a three-month hit for programs like uh, integrated uh, air and missile defense. Um, if you can look uh, more broadly at the, the which particular sectors within the defense and aerospace sector in the US are being most affected by COVID, I, I understand that uh, the Pentagon has given briefings um, outlining uh, particular effects on particular subsections of the industry. Uh, that's right. Uh, folks that are tracking the, uh, the health of the defense uh, industry are seeing effects in, in two areas uh, of particular concern. I should back up and, and note that the Defense Department has two different entities that are solely focused on, on the health and the viability of different elements of the industrial base that supply uh, the, the supply equipment for, uh, for the military services. So you've got the Defense Contract Management Agency, that looks at about 10,000 Pentagon suppliers, including what they call prime contractors. And that's not just the, the big uh, five or six uh, companies, the Lockheeds, the Boeings, the Raytheons, but uh, a number of other second and third tier companies that they also lump into with that category. And then there's the Defense Logistics Agency, which looks at another um, nearly uh, 10 or 11,000 vendors that are commercial suppliers, but also supply the U.S. military. So it's a it's a huge portfolio, and they've been tracking, tracking these. Uh, most of them have managed uh, apparently to stay open um, during the uh, during the initial uh, meltdown. In, in, a, in a total about in total about six hundred shuttered their doors uh, in the early weeks uh, of uh, of March and, and April. Um, I don't have current figures on on how many have um, opened. Back up, but they were beginning to uh, in recent weeks. But it's the, the two sectors DOD is particularly concerned about are the aviation sector and the automotive sector. And uh, many of these companies uh, that supply DOD are uh, th their military business is a, a small portion of what they do. And so the uh, the extremely adverse uh, effects of the Basically, complete collapse of commercial, uh, you know, commercial air travel um, are of great concern to DoD, and they they've been accelerating payments uh, that they had planned to make uh, to many of these companies as a way to try and uh, increase the cash flow. But eventually, these companies, even though they're they're closed or or have slowed down, at some point they're going to have to. Uh, well, it's, it's basically an inefficiency that is going to have to be reckoned with at some point down the line as they begin to tally what these costs are. I see. So the uh, accelerated payments that you mentioned, that's more of a kind of a, a, a Band-Aid sticking plaster uh, solution and something more structural has to be implemented in the, in the medium to long term because, after all, the, the, the negative financial and economic repercussions of COVID are, are going to last for, for some time. That's correct. Um, what else are... 
the prime contractors themselves doing in order to sort of alleviate the the burden on the smaller companies in their supply chains. You know, Ben, this is an issue that I have looked closely at. So, but I but I can say that as DoD thinks about how they are going to manage the costs associated with um, the in, you know the inefficiencies related to COVID, there has been um, a curious silver lining for DoD with the uh, with the collapse of oil prices. The Defense Department. The Defense Department is uh, one of the largest consumers of uh, oil in the world, uh, and they have a very um, uh, they, they have a, they have an entire agency that's dedicated to acquiring fuel and then uh, and and then distributing it, basically reselling it to the military services. And once a year, they lock in a price that they uh, for for um, for selling to the. Within within the Defense Department, so they set that they set that the bar at more than one hundred and twenty dollars per barrel in October, and of course in in March, late March or early April, the price of oil just completely collapsed, and that now means the Defense Department, uh, which had budgeted billions and billions of dollars to uh, to buy this oil, effectively has that uh, that that, uh, that that cash uh, on hand. And it should be available to uh, to reprogram or to shift around to offset um, um, uh, some of these other costs that have come in. So that is, uh, uh, from a budgetary perspective, uh, the one bit of uh, sort of good news that DoD has is it uh, reckons with uh, how to uh, pay for some of these near-term uh, COVID-related costs. That's right. It's, it's, it's a good point to mention the the oil price, but of course, uh, what the, what goes down can always go back up again. And I think uh, there is. I don't know whether it's what what's called a dead cat bounce or not, but the uh, the oil price is just slowly beginning to recover. Um, so uh, maybe another dark cloud looming on the horizon, perhaps. Um, so, do you see any any sign of a kind of a, a, a coherent or integrated uh, plan involving the public sector and the private sector to build a, a kind of a lasting recovery or, or specific recovery uh, post-COVID for the defense industry? That's a good question, Ben. The Defense Department, I mean, the president, um, uh, President Trump, uh, just this week has put the Pentagon in charge of a what he calls a whole of effort a whole of government effort to um, to find a a vaccine by the end of this year. It's a bit controversial because you know a few days later there uh, you know a uh, a draft memo for Defense Secretary Mark Esper's signature has surfaced, indicating that Pentagon planning, internal planning, assumes there will be no vaccine. Uh, into next year. So I think much of uh, the, the, the response and um, uh, to this crisis has, uh, has, has appears to be uh, fractured. And uh, uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm not sure what, uh, I'm not sure that there is a, a whole of government effort here. I see. And uh, it's worth mentioning that uh, perhaps the United States, it, States isn't uh, isn't unique uh, in in this in this respect. Uh, difficult for any any government, any authority to react uh, uh, to, to such a, a, a difficult situation. But uh, I suppose one eventually a, a, a structured response, a whole of government response, is uh, is uh, would be would be welcomed by uh, by the defence sector. Um, just looking ahead to a few years down the line, um, I do know that. Uh, the last time there was a big uh, financial um, crash um, around the world, a big economic recession, um, it did take about 18 to 24 months before the, uh, the budget cycles, the spending cycles for the aerospace and defence sector were affected by that, by the recession that followed the financial crisis. Um, there's a lot of talk about a recession a global recession um, uh, affecting um, everybody post-COVID. 
Um, bearing that in mind, uh, Jason, do you actually foresee uh, uh, an even larger <laughs> fiscal and economic cloud on the horizon for the DoD budget? I think there. I think there is. Um, we, the, there, um, the federal government has uh, jumped in um, with efforts to provide a stopgap measure to push money uh, into the economy while everyone has been mandated to stand down. And this is projected to add more than, uh, to, to bring the, the, the annual def deficit this year to more than $4 trillion, which is a number that's just almost without comparison in recent history. So there's going to be, uh, I expect there's going to be uh, a lot of pressure um, next year to begin to look at getting that deficit down. And anytime there is a discussion about how to address the spending side of the equation, defense is a part of it. And, um, and so the Defense Department is, is just coming off a 10-year effort to, uh, reduce, uh, to reduce spending, uh, discretionary spending as a part of uh, the 2011 uh, Control Act, which Require the Defense Department to cut about five hundred billion dollars uh, compared to their their planned spending uh, in in twenty eleven, and so I think DoD does need to think about um, need, does need to prepare for uh, for reduced spending, um, not only as a part of the deficit, but it, it it could be that there is, and some analysts have pointed out that is uh, as the the effects of this uh, virus continue to work their way through society, uh, absent a, a vaccine, uh, there may be uh, uh, public support for in, in the United States for public health spending and other domestic priorities may increase relative, uh, you know, to support for defense. So, you know, the Defense Department is, has a spending plan and a budget and a strategy that is, that, that calls for a three to five percent annual in, you know, real growth in spending. And that is not in the offing. And so the Defense Department yes. is going to need to think about how, how it uh, reconciles uh, sort of what it wants and what the resources uh, uh, and what the available resources are. And we may see a push once again to clear out, quote unquote, legacy weapon system programs in order to finance uh, projects. Uh, that are based around new technology that uh, that the that the national defense strategy says uh, the United States needs, such as uh, uh, hypersonic maneuvering weapons, uh, directed energy, um, big data analytics, artificial intelligence, uh, new space capabilities. There may be a push to um, to get rid of heavy, big uh, weapon system platforms that. Uh, that don't align with that new strategy. And that's always a very, very difficult thing to accomplish uh, with weapon system programs that have um, um, powerful uh, and well-established constituencies. So it's going to be very interesting. Jason Sherman, thank you very much. You're welcome, Ben. I'm Shepard Media's, our editor, Tim Martin, and I'm delighted to say I'm joined on the line by BIE Systems Product Line Director for Sensors uh, Processing and Exploitation, John Hogan. And um, we're going to be discussing uh, BIE's use of uh, machine learning and uh, intelligence. Uh, and John, th thanks so much for, for joining us. Uh, thank you for having me. Yeah, so John, before we get on to uh, some of the work that BIE are involved in, uh, in, in this area, particularly with uh, DARPA's Geospatial Cloud Analytics Program. Um, could you just maybe set out the scene a little bit by uh, explaining to the listeners the, the primary use uh, of machine learning capabilities by defence contractors uh, and their customers? Sure. Uh, if we take a look at the area of human-machine uh, teaming and humans and machines working together. So we each have strengths and weaknesses depending on the tasks required so an example of this is how we interact with the environment with our smartphones. So humans are asking machines to perform tasks that they're good at performing. For, in, for instance, directions in an unknown city, 
And then the machine is asking humans to navigate through a crowded street where there's lots of population, densely populated, and those movements are pretty unpredictable. So machine learning is used to perform tasks that uh, don't require humans or when human machine speed is required to execute a task, when the decisions that have to be made are faster than a human can make them. Okay, and in the in, at the in the military sense, then uh, I suppose the 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 main sense of things would be that uh, we're, we're trying in effect to um, have the take away manual tasks uh, from from operators. W- would that be kind of in a, in a nutshell? Uh, what's what really underpins uh, this work? A couple of things. One is um, data that's be on the internet that Google and Amazon typically process. They're processing those in huge, great tools that are well-suited for the Department of Defense that works on really sparse data and often learn from one handful of events to try to predict the future events. And so we're doing that both in um, uh, large platforms and then in smaller platforms where we have low swap, uh, size, weight, and power. Things like UAVs were really resource constrained and creating systems that can um, use these predictive analytics on those really resource constrained systems. Okay, and as I mentioned just at the, at when we began to, to talk, uh, BAE has invested in Maple technology as a bespoke service to customers. Um, can you break down the, the tech technology and, and explain the, the uses for DARPA's geospatial cloud analytics program? Sure. Let's just start with what MAPLE is. So MAPLE stands for multi int Analytics for Pattern Learning and Exploitation. It's really a suite of tools that's extensible, works on a, a multi-data uh, uh, types and frameworks, and it's used for what's called all sorts of exploitation. So it can work on different problems in different domains. So the government MBA sets have been partnered for about 15 years. We call models from many data sources to generate analytics products that provide different kinds of analysis. One is patterns of life. The next is uh, detecting um, anomalies in those activities in the patterns of life, and then characterizing, classifying objects and behaviors, and then trying to predict those future uh, activities. So normally what we would do is we would configure Maple for each standalone product, and so that, that really approaches a discrete problem set uh, so I can provide an overview of the functionality, but not necessarily the full capabilities. So the first one is discovery. So it discovers patterns in activities. Activities, Sequence learning. So it discovers the sequence of the patterns. Anomaly detection and the learning. Detects anomalous activities, so something out of the normal, and provides an alert for that. And then also behavior modeling. So it takes a set of activities and alert when a certain behavior is detected or not detected. So with the recent um, GCA contract, Global uh, Geospatial Cloud Analytics, uh, what we're trying to do there is develop a technology for automated services there. And instead of building one discrete set of services, uh, we're putting that on a cloud as a service. So what we can do is take data sets from all over the world, put it into the cloud, and then um, do modeling for that, and then provide a worldwide situational awareness for a diverse range of different domains. So when Maple is a cloud service, um, DARPA chose illegal phishing because that's a problem around the world. And basically what it does is they're using it as a proxy for other tactical problems that they want to analyze for the future. So it's really about developing a flexible analysis system that can be used uh, to recognize uh, different patterns in different domains. Okay, and in terms of kind of the, the as you mentioned, it's going to be used to, to track illegal phishing. Um, at what scale would, would the technology be used? I mean, what, you know, breadth of, uh, you know, breadth of location or, you know, what, um, what ports, for example, might this be used at? Or can you, can you give a, a sense of, of that, for example? So typically what it would be used for is in, um, is in uh, U.S. waters or other international zones where fishing is only allowed certain times of the year or it's within a 
country's fishing area and other countries tend to to go in that so they monitor that with um just overhead commercial imagery and then they can detect fishing behavior and if it's in an exclusion zone it sends an alert about that Okay, so I suppose bottom line here, this would kind of um, this would reduce uh, the man hours potentially needed um, to to do the job, uh, and you know, take uh, mean that those those resources could could be used uh, elsewhere. Um, it could take. It only needs maybe one operator, and they could monitor almost the entire world. Okay, and, and would you consider the work and the partnership? Is it experimental at this stage, or is it you know a firm? contract and with uh, an option to kind of move towards um you know a greater integration between uh bae and darpa or or what can you can you say on that front they'll do is they they build generations of uh, demonstration systems and then what typically happens is we'll transition to another agency that will use it um what they say operationally so we prototype in darpa we transition it to offices that will use it uh, later on. So right now, uh, what we're looking at is uh, taking this and integrating it into an, another agency's uh, monitoring system. And then uh, because it's on the cloud, it's almost like a subscription service for, uh, it's really like a central clearinghouse for uh, this kind of analytics. Okay, and then in, in an operational sense, then um, could you perhaps outline how the Air, F- Air Force might use this? I mean, theoretically, um, you know, we have to be clear here. And just in practical terms, could you give an example? And that's not to say that um, the example that you do provide is is something that you know will end up happening. I'm just you know asking for you know just some context around that. So people used to use things like just in time inventories and things like that. So what Maple could be used for is to monitor and predict when uh, parts would be either be, be out of compliance or fail. Then they could do just-in-time inventory there and only ship the parts to the area that are actually needed. So that will really, really drive costs down. And, and large aircraft programs getting costs down and out of it over time is really a main thrust. Okay, so yeah, firm sense there then that logistics here would, would could potentially have a, a very important role. Um, I mean, there's a lot of talk and discussion at the moment, I suppose, John, in terms of uh, AI and uh, automated uh, weapon systems capabilities. Um, now, obviously not to confuse the two between machine learning and, and AI, but would you see that there's, there's any overlap between the two in, in that particular area and uh, you know, for example, the U.S. Air Force um, are talking about a little bit about the moment, or at least have, have floated the idea that potentially the net, their next fighter jet um, would be uh, small, uh, small batches of aircraft um, produced every five years. So they want to kind of um, develop this idea that pr- procurement can happen in, in much quicker cycles than perhaps the, the twenty um, to, to thirty year cycles that have been previously. Um, but also on top of that, then there would be um, the introduction of, of automated uh, weapon systems potentially. Um, so, just so just to be clear, if AI is used for that or machine learning, would you? Uh, what would you see the the uh, road of travel on that front? Yeah, so I can't comment on any specific weapon system, but I can tell you that um, basically what what we we do is we use what's called proxies. So. AI will do it, will bring it to a certain point, and then humans take over. You know, they may learn patterns of activities and things like that. They inform the human, and the human makes makes final decisions. Okay. Um, what would you see as kind of the the next um, big paradigm shift, I suppose, in, in machine learning? Or uh, what else do you uh, foresee BAE being involved in? So for BAE... Um, like we said, predictive analytics, um, you know, driving uh, cost out of maintenance. Also, for in our factories where we have uh, typically we use statistical process control on trying to figure out when something goes out of specification. Because if you produce parts out of specification, it's much more expensive down the line to fix them. So, using predictive analytics and Maple to uh, predict when a system will. We'll go out of specifications. We can shut a production down, line down slowly, 
and not incur those extra costs either for us or for our customers. Okay. Uh, well, John, I'm very thankful to be speaking to you on, on, on all of those matters and very much appreciate your, your time. And uh, we look forward to uh, catching up with you again, perhaps, as uh, developments progress. Thanks so much. Okay. Thank you very much. At Shepherd Media, we understand defense and aerospace audiences and how to reach them. We've been doing that for four decades, and now you can fill the gap left by cancelled trade shows with Shepard's new Defence Audiences marketing solution. Defence Audiences aims to mitigate the lack of events by bringing innovative marketing to the forefront of the industry, allowing you to take advantage of our digital leadership to achieve your marketing goals for the year. Our Defence Audiences offering provides predefined and bespoke packages of solutions for companies looking to tell their stories and influence key defense decision makers with product launches, thought leadership, lead generation, or product education. To position your brand centrally to the defense and aerospace markets, speak to Shepherd Media about how defense audiences will help you today. This episode of the Weekly Defense Podcast was brought to you in partnership with our sponsor, Namo. As always, a big thanks to everyone that took the time in being a part of the episode. And for our listeners, make sure you like and subscribe and leave a review on iTunes and tell a friend or a colleague about the podcast. Until next week, thanks for listening. 